fourth event and you're still inviting me. I don't understand it. Uh, well, first of all, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Um, and, uh, and this is a, a necessary and continuing uh, dialogue which uh, uh, we in the Liberal Party in particular, but I, I would adopt Brad's views that uh, all parliamentarians need to engage in and, um, and so therefore uh, it is a, a worthwhile document there, uh, a continuing dialogue. Um, I was much persuaded by uh, an article in the Toronto Star uh, where uh, Louise Arbour uh, talks about uh, the Tamils await their peace dividend. And I don't know how many of you caught it, but there was a couple of paragraphs in there that I thought uh, were, were very uh, worthwhile and, um, and uh, need to be repeated. <clears throat> Indeed, any positive outcomes that could flow from the LLRC, and that's this, uh, this is the report here. I'm sure many of you have, uh, have uh, looked at it very carefully. Um, will likely remain theoretical given that the report failed to provide a thorough and independent investigation of alleged violations of international human, uh, humanitarian and human rights law and the final stages of the war as demanded by the UN and others including Canada. From the beginning, the government hamstrung the LLRC by giving it a feeble mandate, choosing pro-government -govern uh, commissioners with clear conflicts of interest and failing to provide any witness protection. And um, all of that has been borne out by evidence both direct and anecdotal. She goes on further to say, the LLRC's report accepts at face value the largely unexamined claims of senior government and military officials who planned and executed the war, fails to adequately address the many credible allegations detailed in last April's report of the UN Secretary General's panel of experts on accountability in Sri Lanka and rolls back well-established principles of international law. In the end, the LLRC works to exonerate the government and in so doing it undermines its own limited calls for further inquiry, including a call for yet another government investigation of the above mentioned video footage, which officials, officials have repeatedly described as faked. Um, Madam Justice Arbour is, if you will, one of my judicial heroes. <laughs> and um, if, uh, if there was a conflict of evidence, uh, if there was a conflict of opinion, I would frankly prefer Madam Justice Arbour's opinion over pretty well all else. Um, she has established herself over her career as a, not only a credible justice, uh, but a, a, a literally incredible um, uh, advocate for human rights. And, um, and I think uh, in our uh, pantheon of uh, credible people, uh, people who advocate for, uh, for human rights issues, in our Canadian pantheon, uh, she is surely among uh, some of the first and foremost uh, of our um, most credible people. Um, and clearly she has staked out, if you will, the um, moral high ground. Um, and clearly uh, those who are far more articulate than I will call for further investigations, further inquiries done by credible panels, done by people who uh, don't have conflicts of interest, don't have uh, the pressures that they might be under uh, by, by the government itself. Uh, but the real question now is, where do we go from here? Uh, it's clear that the government of Sri Lanka will not volunteer up another inquiry. Um, to do so would it be a tacit admission uh, that this was a bit of a whitewash. So um, I adopt completely uh, the Justice's view, Madam Justice Arbour's uh, view, but there are still people that are suffering. There are still people who are having um, the daily experiences of this uh, government which are uh, negative. So the question really is, in the short term, where do we go from here? And, um, and I, uh, I know my friend uh, David Kilgore is, if you haven't already spoken, David, uh, will uh, likely uh, speak about uh, uh, the uh, 13th uh, Constitutional Amendment, which is essentially a substantial devolution of, uh, of authority. Uh, David and I had the good fortune to travel to Sri Lanka together, and we came out alive, which was pretty good too, especially after that helicopter ride. Uh, 
Yeah, we uh, we went from one side of the island to the other in the president's helicopter, and, um, and there were some uh, occasionally nervous moments, shall we say? Um, and um, and uh, and uh, we, in fact, uh, particularly David, advocated for a, a federation, a devolution of authority, much like what we experience in Canada, where there's a there is a substantial um, authorities in health and education that are uh, in, uh, in that are devolved to subnational forms of government. Uh, we frankly didn't get much take up on that idea. Um, I don't know that the climate has actually improved where that idea might actually be taken up, but in some respects, Canada models uh, the uh, devolution of authorities. So that is one idea, and I'll leave David to um, articulate that far better than can I. Um, I, uh, I think that one of the levers that you can uh, work with is that the government of Sri Lanka does value its reputation. Um, and, if it, and, and I put to you, uh, if you will, the vigorous political campaign to denigrate the Channel 4 video. If you didn't care about your reputation, you wouldn't work so hard at trying to offset the negative impact of that video. Um, you know, the, frankly, the High Commissioner works very hard here, um, and uh, she is everywhere uh, trying to uh, convey the message of the government of Sri Lanka. If they didn't care about their reputation, then they wouldn't be working so hard. Now, it may be that you are to be indirectly commended because a lot of you <laughs> work, uh, if you will, the other side of the street and uh, force the High Commissioner and force the government to, to um, try to articulate to uh, people like myself and other colleagues uh, that, uh, uh, that there is a, another story. I, um, I uh, think you can use that as leverage. Um, I think you, if, if the government frankly didn't care, uh, then it wouldn't work so hard. Um, and so, uh, so ironically, um, I think you, you have some leverage in that respect. I throw out a thought. And that is whether Canada could use its influence, its position as a director of the World Bank, to uh, attribute some conditionality to loans to Sri Lanka. And I don't know whether that's an idea that's been discussed. I don't know the implications of that idea uh, necessarily. Um, but there, there is a certain amount of leverage that we might well be able to use as a nation to a call to accountability, call uh, the uh, government of Sri Lanka to accountability for what's happened. I throw that out as an idea. I, um, I don't criticize the uh, Prime Minister, frankly, for uh, saying, well, I'm not going to the, uh, uh, the Commonwealth meeting unless uh, you, you, know, you have an open and fair, transparent uh, inquiry. I think actually that's not such a bad thing. Um, having said that, it's only a good thing if, in fact, there's a lot of work being done by our High Commission in Sri Lanka and with the authorities of the government of Sri Lanka. Diplomacy is a real pain in the arse. You know, <laughs> it's actually sometimes a lot easier to just drop bombs on people. Um, you know, diplomacy is going to meetings that you don't want to go to, meeting people you don't want to meet, eating food that you don't want to eat. Uh, drinking drinks that, oh gosh, do I have to drink this too? Uh, and it's painstaking work. You know, David was in, was one of our diplomats, uh, effectively an elected diplomat. And he knows how many of these things he said. And why do you do it? You do it so that you can have influence in the corridors of power. You know, it's great to do press releases. I love doing press releases, <laughs> you know. But it doesn't actually move the agenda. So I'm hoping, and, um, and possibly you could ask uh, government representatives, whether, in, uh, whether the prime minister's gesture is actually being, uh, which in and of itself is, appears to be a good gesture, is being substantiated by intense diplomatic work, um, whereby uh, you do all of those things that you really, really don't want to do with people you really don't want to do it with, because uh, that's the only way in which you get some internal um, division. So I throw those out as, uh, as three ideas. Um, I think that uh, um, Madam Justice Arbour has uh, staked out both the moral uh, high ground 
Uh, she has a legally compelling uh, view, uh, which necessarily needs to be pursued, and anything that this group can do to compel the pursuit of that. Two, however, uh, this is a long game. Um, the political solution to the issues in Sri Lanka will not be achieved anytime soon. Three, you need to have um, a long game, but you also need to have a short game. And four, I think you can uh, trade on the desire of the government of Sri Lanka to be, have a higher esteem in the family of nations. Five, you can ask your own government to uh, not only make dramatic gestures and press releases, but to do the hard work of diplomacy. And six, you can reasonably ask where we have influence in the, in the, uh, in the various uh, multinational organizations, such as the World Bank, uh, why is it that we can't put conditionality upon things like loans, grants, et cetera, et cetera. So I offer you those uh, as, um, as uh, suggestions only. Um, this, is, uh, this is, after all, a conference where people have thought a great deal about issues uh, pertaining to Sri Lanka. It may be that uh, some of those ideas are not viable, um, in which case I'm perfectly happy to hear about it. But on others, uh, they're, uh, they may might well be viable. So I, I see a hand over there. <laughs> do I do, I do Q&A or not? Sure. OK, great. Hey, John. Um, I'm one of your constituents that have been dealing with your writing. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the writing. We love you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to love you guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, my question to you is, I, I struggle, and I'm here today. Second CHRB conference, and I hear a lot of times that peace will take a long time, we've got to wait, we've got to wait. Yet, the suffering continues. Why don't we come up with a statement that said, we need to stop, we need to address those issues, call it what it is, call it human rights violation, say it needs to stop rather than peace will take a long time. That's my issue. Yeah. And I want, hopefully, it, I just want the most experienced parliament yeah. experience we have in Ottawa right now. Well, I, I actually I think those statements are coming out, and I can't imagine a more articulate statement than than Louise Arbour in terms of uh, this this thing being whitewash. Um, and and the, the 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 other thing I would say to you is that you know the the all 308 of us could stand and preach the gospel that this might stop, and it won't stop. Um, and, um, and uh, regrettably, this conflict is a conflict that's existed for literally generations. And, um, and, but, you know, there are conflicts that do stop. And there are conflicts that uh, uh, where um, after a bizarre number of years, uh, the peoples do get on. And I look at my own heritage, which is Irish. <laughs> we battled it out for 400 years, for goodness sakes. <laughs> Um, and um, largely, uh, that conflict has uh, has, in some in some measure, uh, resolved itself. So, uh, it's hard to preach patience when it's your relatives. I mean, you know, the people have come into my office and told me the stories that they tell me. I just, you know, you just don't know what to say. You just don't know what to say. So, uh, you raise an extremely legitimate point. Um, it's very hard to uh, to uh, uh, do anything, but I think this conference is, in some respects, one of those things where you can explore ideas and try to figure out which ones are uh, will be workable, long-term, short-term, immediate.